thank you for inviting me here. I especially want to thank uh, Zochi Adami, who I think it was her idea to invite me, so I heard. Um, do I look like a Sufi? <laughs> what do you think? I should have a turban, <laughs> right? Probably a robes. Yeah, yeah. I have a beard. Say cool things. You know, <laughs> that's uh, the image that people have of of Sufism is tends to be um, focused on uh, what is fundamentally a cultural expression of the mystical path, right? Because <clears throat> Sufism uh, is grounded in Persia, and uh, some people say goes back as far as the Egyptian mystery schools and maybe even further back. And um, it, it, it immigrated or uh, moved to India and uh, then came to the West in oh, 1900s, I guess. So what you see as a Sufi, when you're studying Sufism, is a lot of um, what I think of as cultural expressions of an esoteric path. So that someone who is in Syria is going to express it in a particular way that's, that's uh, applicable to them. Or in, her, uh, well, Iran now. Uh, there's still Sufis in Iran. They, they're kind of underground, but they're there. Um, <clears throat> and in Egypt, and in India, and Turkey, and now it's in the West. Came here in, um, the first proponent of Sufism was Hajar and Khan, who came here in 1910. It was my teacher's father, Pierre Valiant's father. And he was told by his teacher, Abu Hashim Madani, to study the world's religions. Everybody else that was a student of, or a, um, a follower of Abu Hashim Madani uh, was Muslim, followed an Islamic path, but not an icon. He was given direct instruction to um, learn the world's religions and find a comparative basis to express the Sufi ideal through all paths. And in fact, when he came here and started to uh, teach, most of the references that he used were from Christianity or Judaism, very few from Islam, because that's what people knew. They didn't know Islam <clears throat> in the United States and in Europe. And what I believe has happened very slowly over the decades, for the last 100 years now, isn't it, uh, <clears throat> is a merging, a melding, and it's happening in all kinds of ways, not just with us, obviously, of the Western secular point of view, the idea that the scientific method is the most appropriate means of, of exploring the universe, mixing that with uh, the mystical, spiritual uh, experience that, uh, that you have when you go into deep meditation, and you bring the two together and we're creating a third thing, but it's just in its infancy. Uh, Pierre Valide often said that we, were, we are the midwives of the holistic age. He didn't like new age. He thought holistic was much better. And what that means to me is that we're right on the, we're in the birthing process of this merging between the, the uh, Eastern uh, philosophy and Western scientific method, the uh, Eastern sense of deep inner knowledge and the Western idea that you have to be able to take it apart and look at it, put it back together, take it apart again, <clears throat> which we're good at because we wouldn't have the internet if it wasn't for that. I love the internet. So, <clears throat> so when I'm giving one of these talks, what I like to do is just ask you, you can ask, interrupt me at any time and ask questions because uh, I don't necessarily have a, a complete format to, uh, to talk from. <clears throat> um, what I'd like to do is to ask you, what is it that you believe you are doing to, and you don't have to necessarily answer the question now, it could be rhetorical, what is it that you believe you are doing to enable, encourage this fundamental merging that's now taking place? You know, 
because you know we've tried. Um, gosh, I've been at this for a long time. 35 or 40 years, and I've seen people do all kinds of things to f uh, activate their inner life. Often it involves putting on a uniform of some kind, right? The <laughs> turban or whatever. Uh, the, the, the Krishna consciousness people with their saffron robes <clears throat> and so on. People do that. We've, we've tried all that on, right? We've, we've tried to find a way to encourage our own being to adapt to something that's really alien to us. It's not our culture. So what is it that, it, that culturally you can say is ex expressive of your own sense of spiritual identity that is aiding this unfolding that's slowly occurring? Go ahead. <laughs> Wait a minute. Let me get the mic. Well, the, that you're here at the Theosophical Society, I think, for me personally, um, Theosophy encourages open-minded inquiry. So mm. here we are, inviting you to speak. Right. So that's that's a start. That's it. <laughs> well, <laughs> okay. That, that's a start. Okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, I think that, that, that <clears throat> someone asked me, I was down in the cafeteria, and someone asked me what a Sufi was, what it is that express, expresses that. And I said it was two things, which is not so identical to what you're saying. Uh, is one thing is that it's a continual seeking for truth, which is a vast thing, and you never, ever can pin it down. I mean, if you think you've pinned it down, you're wrong. It's not, it's not possible, because there's too much. But you continually seek after what Hazrat and Khan, Khan called a passion for the unobtainable. So that's part of it, right? And the other part, which to me might even be more important, is developing friendship. Because it's all uh, very well and good. Another thing people like to say, it's all very well and good to imagine a deeply spiritual, very enlightened being sitting in some cave in the Himalayas, looking out over the valleys and just feeling at one with the universe. When it comes down to being in the middle of a traffic jam in Chicago, it's a whole different thing, right? That you're not so quite sure that you feel all that enlightened. But nevertheless, that's the task. Can you do it here? It's actually pretty easy to do it in a cave. Can you do it here? Can you feel uh, all of the experiences that continually unfold in your being around you as you know your, uh, the various annoying things that happen to you every day, the little, <clears throat> the little uh, challenges that we all have? Can you continue to uh, respond to them in, in a, in a um, I want to say healthy way, but that's not quite right, in a, an appropriate way? while at the, you know, and maintaining some kind of balance and calm state of affairs in your being. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. That's, be, uh, that's true, uh, what I would think of as Sufism, or just as being, becoming who you really are. Yeah, uh, just to continue the dialogue on this, um, that is so characteristic of theosophy is the fact of, of bringing the, the scientific or exploratory attitude uh, and merging it with one's spirituality. Right. And in fact, when I first encountered theosophy, it was so rewarding because it freed me from a sort of... Um, feeling of necessity to follow a blind faith and then to realize that I could explore with my mind whatever I could discover and then understand it in a mystical way. Absolutely. <clears throat> so it, what you really said is that it's all about your own personal experience, right? Okay, which can be challenging in and of itself. <clears throat> so What we're doing then is we are developing a pattern in our consciousness, in our subconscious, really, 
that it allows our being to express itself uh, in an appropriate fashion, regardless of what's going on around you, right? Uh, so that even when you're confronted with something disagreeable, oh, that's just disagreeable. That's God being disagreeable, <laughs> which is really what's taking place. <clears throat> uh, can you imagine... You know, at the end of his life, Pirvilayat stopped saying God, and he started saying the universe. And I found that shift kind of interesting because uh, God had the word God has a lot of it has a lot of baggage. You know, we have all kinds of stuff uh, around it. However, whatever word you use, uh, you know, Brahma or Vishnu or or uh, Yahweh, or Allah, or whatever word you use, all, they all have baggage, cultural expressions. But if you say the universe as an intelligent entity, then that's a little different. In an, it, you, can, you can almost feel that there's something there, because there is. You can look out at the sky at night and see the stars. <clears throat> you can see, uh, uh, you can go on the NASA site, you know, that wonderful website, uh, uh, astronomy picture of the day and see these magnificent photographs, all of the um, consciousness of creation. Can you then look out at that and recognize that you have the capacity to, uh, at least in part, understand it? This is, the, this is very, a very cool thing that I keep trying to remind people of. That, you know, I hear, oh, I feel so small and insignificant in the face of the universe. My gosh, we built the Hubble telescope. We're looking at it, you know? How cool is that? And, and this is just the beginning of what's possible for humanity. We're really at a very, in an infancy, a state of infancy, just beginning to uh, understand who we are and how we do it. <clears throat> okay, I wanted to talk about spirituality and how it is that in Sufism, which is really not so different from any esoteric school, uh, we approach it. The first thing <clears throat> to understand about the approach of Sufism is that everyone is spiritual. People will often think that spirituality or someone that has <clears throat> a very deep and powerful uh, Spiritual magnetism is full, has all kinds of special powers and uh, intuition that you may not have, and they'll see into your soul and, and, and tell you your next step and those kind of things. That's all nice and well and good, but the truth is, is that true spirituality is very simply a very natural state. It's you in your most natural sense of being. It's not anything special at all. We'd like to think it is because we'd like to think we're special, but it's not. <clears throat> and that's okay, you can think you're special, but spirituality is not. It's the most natural state that you can experience. When you're in, and, and, and how do you know that you're doing it? When you're actually in a very deep and powerful spiritual uh, state of spirituality? When you're relaxed. It's as simple as that. It, it all develops from repose, first with the body, and then with the mind, and then with the emotions, ultimately with the spirit. And uh, someone, was it you, was asked, oh, we were talking about uh, uh, meditation, oh, it was that young uh, lady. Uh, we were talking about meditation and, 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 uh, and chanting and so on. You know the whole purpose of chanting? Well, it has two purposes, one. Uh, one purpose is when you're chanting a word, Supposedly, I've, uh, it has a, uh, a vibratory effect on you, the actual syllables of the, you know, either Sanskrit or Aramaic. And that may or may not be true. I've never been quite sure about that. <clears throat> One thing that is true is it tires your mind out and you stop thinking. So, so that's, a, that's, that's a more accessible goal, to tire your mind out and stop thinking. And then you can begin to relax the emotions. So, <clears throat> for instance, 
it's a cultural imperative in this country and in Europe that our uh, sense of self it is is disappointment. Everywhere you look around, every single ad that you see on television or in a newspaper or on a magazine or on a billboard addresses disappointment. Oh, you need a better car. You know, your toothpaste is not as good as our toothpaste. And so on and so forth. And aren't you disappointed in your life? Wouldn't it be better if you had this hair color? You know, Grecian formula for men. <clears throat> and so on and so forth. All of these things, every single ad says, you're disappointed in your life, we can help. Right? So what message do you get from a very early age? That you're disappointed. There's something wrong with you. And if you don't access these various products, it's going to continue to be wrong with you. And you'll be just be wrong. That's the message that our culture has begun to adapt. It's been there for a while. That's a total lie. There's nothing wrong with you. There's nothing wrong with any of you. Every one of you is a spiritual being. Was it just that phrase, uh, a spiritual being having a human experience? Isn't that that's the kind of a phrase that's been circling around for a while? Isn't that a cool thing to say? Think how many people have heard that and they thought, gosh, I wonder if that's true. And then they go back to arguing with their husband or <clears throat> having trouble with their car or whatever it is that's going on in their life. Nevertheless, there's that little bit inside, oh, maybe I am a spiritual being having a human experience. And then, of course, because we're Westerners, we want to define it. What does that mean? Now, see, let me see. Have I had past lives? Uh, and if so, who was I? And so on. You know, <clears throat> I'm a professional hypnotist, and people occasionally, we were talking about this earlier, occasionally slip into a past life when I'm working with them. I've never had anybody be a king, ever. Or a prince, or anybody important, ever. They've never, they've always gone into some kind of mundane or just, you know, common kind of experience, like we all are. We're just, you know, normal people. I've never had a Churchill, I never had a Cleopatra, I never had a, a you know, a <coughs> Lao Tzu or any of those things. What happens is that people, when they, when they slip into a past life in, in a therapy session, they'll, it will be, they'll access an aspect of being, not necessarily their being, I don't know, I, I question that. They will access an aspect of the universal being that affected them in some way. That's what I think really happens. Uh, whether or not the soul that you currently or that you as a soul uh, experience other lives? That's a tricky one. Uh, and it could be that uh, uh, in, in more ad, uh, very advanced Sufi, there's very little that you hear in Sufism about reincarnation, but uh, it's there if you dig into the literature. And one of the things, the ways that it's expressed is uh, what we call the Palace of Mirrors. This is a very, if you're familiar with this. You know how in Persia they always have, the, the clothes have mirrors on them? You know, like if, if you get, if you get a fancy vest, it'll have a lot of little mirrors. Right? If you walk into a, uh, uh, an ancient uh, building, there'll often be like mirrored mosaics. They'll use a lot of mirrors for, uh, as part of the mosaic. It's part of this deal of the Palace of Mirrors. The Palace of Mirrors simply state that everything reflects everything else all the time. So everything is always in a state of unity, even though you feel individual. Now, the continuation of that is, is that everything that ever was or will be is happening all the time. So, can you imagine that your soul is expressing itself not only in this body that you're currently existing in, but in a series of bodies? that have been and will be, and they're all going on at the same time. Okay? This would be a more, this is kind of an advanced <clears throat> point of view that you would discover if you, you know, go into really deep into the literature. How does that feel? To think that you're not only you, you're also a series of other yous. It feels that there is no time. There is eternity only. That's right. That's exactly correct. There is no time. Even though there is time because you're experiencing it. So on the one hand you have 
that which is a continual expression of divine intent. And on the other hand, you have your individual experience. Now, I'm going to, I do this with, uh, with my uh, uh, spiritual students as, as well as hy hypnosis people. <clears throat> uh, for instance, with a hypnosis client, I will have them visualize the being that they are becoming as a result of the experience they're doing now. They're quitting smoking, okay, or working on their weight control or uh, anxiety or whatever it may be. And then I'll have them visualize that person existing quite comfortable with this change that they are now struggling with, turning to them and thanking them for the effort that they're currently making in order for this person to exist. Now the key here is that person already exists, that being that you are becoming already exists. You get to determine now the quality that that being exists within. Okay? Just more basic Sufi metaphysics. You're, you're, you're a sta the way that you, the work that you do now, you can, you can either do it or not do it. It's entirely up to you. No one's going to say, you must. That's always true of the greatest esoteric schools. No one says, you must. You're always, you're encouraged, but no one demands. If you're in a state where, if you're in a place where someone is demanding that you do this or that, that's wrong. Well, it might be, you know, it's appropriate for some people, but it's not appropriate for people uh, uh, that are deeply into the spiritual path. You must make your own decisions because it's your experience, it's not mine. I have no idea what you are or who you are becoming. I can't know that, but you can know, right? You can sense it, you can feel it. There's an experience inside that you will recognize, and sometimes it's a little scary, of the being you are becoming. You ever feel that? Like this awesome character? It couldn't possibly be me, <laughs> right? I'm just kind of like, no, couldn't, I can't do that, <laughs> right? But you can, because you are. It is, in fact, happening. Uh, and the way you know, and, you know, the way to notice that. <clears throat> think of yourself in decades. If you're, it's a little easier when you're sixty. <laughs> but you know, even when I was forty, I was thinking, God, I was, I'm a lot smarter than I was when I was twenty. <laughs> you know, God, I was, I was kind of a jerk. And when I was fifteen, I was really a jerk. Uh, but that's, I guess, being a teenage boy. I <laughs> can't help being a jerk. But then, in, in my book, for instance, I talk about the whole, the, um, what I think of as the um, embarrassment factor. I think I call it the path of embarrassment. Isn't that what it's called in the, the chapter? Well, I've lost track. <clears throat> I think it's called the path of embarrassment. Anyway, and the idea is, to my mind at least, if you are doing this work, and you are serious about it, and you are never experiencing moments of embarrassment, you're not doing the work. You're not really paying attention. You're just, uh, you're, you know, doing some kind of ego trip. Uh, because spirituality and the, the, will, will constantly challenge you to demand of yourself an excess of expression of, of uh, inner power. And that's not from an egoistic point of view, not dominance, but power over yourself, not dominating other people. Although that's a, a, a danger often. You see people do it. So it's, 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 it's a very complicated and uh, challenging world that we're living in right now because we're being asked to establish something brand new that's never been done before. And that is this meeting of science and spirit. Pierre Vallat was very excited about it. He used to <clears throat> get all excited about new physics. And my friend, uh, who is a physicist, says he, <laughs> he kept getting the science wrong. But <laughs> it didn't seem to matter because his enthusiasm was so he would, uh, he was, do you, do you know who David Bohm was? No. You know, right? He was, they, him and Pierre Vallette and David Bohm were, were best friends. 
and he would get very, very, they were constantly, I used to, I used to watch them together, you know, when David Bone was in New York, and they'd just get so excited to get a chance to actually be in the same room and have a conversation. Uh, and his uh, experiments in the holistic universe, I think he's the one that actually coined the word, didn't he? Or the holographic, the holographic universe, that's it, right? <clears throat> is exactly the experience of someone in a deep state of, um, I don't want to say meditation, because that's, that's, it's what meditation leads to in a deep state of communion. OK? Remember what I said a little while ago that it's really about repose, relaxation, relaxing the mind, relaxing the body, relaxing um, the emotions. There's a point that you can attain when you get, I don't want to say attain, that's not right. It's more that it just happens. When you become utterly relaxed and there's no trace of you left, you're just sitting there, then the universe can recognize you. As long as you're sitting there with your idea of yourself and your insistence on being this or that, the universe has no access, right? The, the intelligent universe, or what we call God, it doesn't. But if you can, once you get to a point, and it, and it, and it requires some discipline and, 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 and practice, it doesn't happen overnight. Although it can, <laughs> that's, that's the trick. But uh, I wouldn't wish that on you. Um, when you become totally, utterly, in a state of repose where you're just sitting there, then the universe can enter into you and look through your eyes. But not until. Okay? So it's not something that you can just kind of like uh, go and you know, go to the drugstore and pay for. Be nice. But <clears throat> I wanted to just mention something about it happening without any effort. There's a price that you pay. When you work up to it, you're very, what you're really doing in a lot of this work is you're retraining your personality. Okay? When you, you grow up in this culture, you have all kinds of uh, 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 buzzwords that are, that are in your brain. You have attitudes that came from your family, the culture that you, you lived in, your genetic heritage. Uh, all of these things you, know, have, you have to deal with. And then you very slowly, through meditation, your uh, study, uh, uh, um, uh, hopefully with some kind of spiritual guidance from somebody who's been at it a little longer, <clears throat> those kind of things, you very slowly retrain your personality to accept uh, those moments of terror when you shift into a higher state of consciousness. Okay? I bet you everybody here has experienced that at least once. Being, being afraid and then just pushing through. That's <clears throat> okay, so that's the, the developmental thing. It takes a while. It should take a while. If it happens all at once, it can happen all at once. You know, the universe just says, I want him or her. Bang. There's a price. And the price is your personality. Right? Y'all know the story of St. Francis of the CC? He just, you know, he had a revelation one day. He went from being a soldier to being a saint one day to the next day. And uh, he lost his personality. They see that movie, Brother, Son, Sister, Moon? They, they, uh, they, they showed it very well. So <clears throat> I'm, I'm telling you all this because there's, because of our, the way our culture is, where we expect to be able to buy it or just to get it, we expect it to be fast. And we want it now. And we'd like to be able to know that if we're going to expend an effort, we want to pay back. Right? Doesn't that feel normal? I'm going to sit here and meditate for, tw you know, for 20 minutes a day for the next six months. I want to know that something's going to happen. That's the way we are. OK? We have to get over that. That's not how it works. <laughs> But it'd be nice if it did, but it doesn't. 
So imagine that what you're really doing is you're living your life from day to day and you've decided that this is going to be part of your life and that's it. If anything develops from that, that's wonderful. If it doesn't, that's wonderful too. Uh, in my book, I, I, there's two chapters that I devote to uh, someone who was my best friend for many years, uh, Michael Brain, who passed in uh, 99. The second book, <clears throat> or the, second, the last chapter is about death, and I, I opened the chapter with uh, an obituary that I wrote for him. And uh, he was full of wonderful little tidbits and sayings. He was, he was, uh, there was a there was an American merchant named Shamsha Borsh, who was a. Uh, uh, he was a, a, a student of Hazar and Khan. He was, in fact, his translator and his secretary for a while. And he ended up living in California, and my friend Michael was his assistant. He was kind of, because he was an old guy, and he kind of drove me around and took care of him and things for a, for a couple of years. And uh, he told me an interesting thing about him. He said, Mr. Shamsher said, uh, I've never had any experiences. None. No magnificent lights going off, no fireworks, no angels dancing in front of me. None of that. But the practices that I've done have made me what I am, which was an extremely insightful, brilliant man. He was an engineer, and what he did for a living was he, uh, made, he designed nuclear torpedoes for the Navy. Right? And my, Michael asked him, why are you doing that? You're, you're a Sufi sheikh, for goodness sakes. <laughs> and he says, well, who better than me? You think these will ever be used? They work. So it's not always what it seems. Right? There's always a subtext, and then a subtext, and a subtext. What Pierre Vallette used to call the cause within the cause within the cause that underlies, underpins, who we think we are. So imagine for a moment that who you think you are is uh, in a state of flux. And that what it is is really just kind of a handy thing to, to uh, hold on to because it's helpful because you have to get up in the morning and think of that you're somebody, you know, you're something. But the truth is, is that you're much bigger. You know, one of the things that when you're when you're a spiritual guy, one of the things you hear a lot from people, almost every single person says this at some point to you, what am I going to have to give up? Right? Or I really don't like this part of myself. When can I get rid of it? or variations on those two themes. And what I always say, I don't know what necessarily what other people say, but what I always say to them is, well, you don't actually lose that part or get rid of it. What happens is you get bigger. So that part becomes less important. That's really the key to recognize. It becomes less important. So if you have some kind of issue that that's just seems all-encompassing and it it uh, is continually pestering you with its, uh, with its insistence on your recognizing it and, and, and allowing it to control you, uh, perhaps you can get bigger than it. It's not going to go away. You're not going to forget it. You know? Uh, you know, one of the things that, you, that every spiritual guide deals with, and, and I certainly deal with it as a hypnotist, and, you know, uh, therapists do and is, is, is serious trauma for somebody that we I sub, submit that pretty much everyone in this room has had some kind of trauma we all had it something uh, some very serious what do you do with that you know uh, that's part of the the living the life of, of a human being is uh, those challenges so you get bigger than it is. Recognizes, you know, it's 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 a factor in my life. 
It affects me in very profound ways, but it doesn't affect all of me. I'm bigger than that, more than that. I'm a spiritual being having a human experience, right? Okay. Questions? Comments? Uh, criticisms? <laughs> no criticisms. <laughs> um, you were talking about repose yes. before. And uh, you and I were talking about before the talk about the differences between the Sufi tradition, which you are a part of, and more mainstream Islam. Mm -hmm. uh, have you ever had any direct uh, experiences with that sort of uh, disharmony between the two? Oh my gosh! Or and and <laughs> and did you or didn't did you not keep repose, or how did that play out in terms of your <laughs> spiritual? Uh, I mean, did I get annoyed? Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's one way of saying it. Yeah. Uh, I, you know, probably. <laughs> um, I don't like to single out Islam specifically, although it, it's a factor in, obviously, because, you know, Sufism is very closely identified with Islam. But it happens from anybody, no matter their religion. If they think they're more right than anything else, there's nothing you can do with that, right? And uh, you know, my very best friend in the whole world is, 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 is a Muslim. And uh, beside my wife, that is. Uh, it's, it's a woman that lives in Vienna, and we're, we're very close. She's a Muslim, and we've talked about this many times. And she gets very annoyed at the uh, foolishness of assuming that your rightness is better than anyone else's rightness and I can kill you as a result. I'm perfectly justified in doing that, you see. And that goes across the board, you know? If you read about, uh, uh, and by the way, this is not the first time this has happened, that Islam has had this kind of uh, rise of fundamentalism. It happened again, it happened in the, uh, uh, when did Maimonides live? 12th century, 13th century, 1200 something, right? During his, during his lifetime. There was a very, very, essentially Wahhabism spread all across North Africa and, and the people that were in control, if they didn't, you know, they killed, they killed Christians, Muslims, and Jews if they didn't agree, you know, with their particular extremely strict form. And then, of course, there's our own uh, history of the Crusades, right? You know about that? And so on. It just goes on and on and on and on with, with people continually demanding that somehow they're right. They're not. They're just right as far as they're concerned. And that's fine, you know, but uh, when you impose it on someone else, that's not so good. Another question? We have one from the internet. Oh, cool. Marina asks, how do we learn that we are, quote, bigger than that, unquote, to overcome trauma? Through relaxation, meditation only? No, guidance is very helpful uh, of some sort. It may be, a, it may be a, a therapist. It may be a spiritual guide. It may be just the guy on the corner who happens to have a wisdom that you don't have. Uh, Pierre Valiat used to say when uh, this problem, when this issue came up, and I subscribe to it very strongly, that when you're looking for a guide or you find a guide, you seek a guide and you want it, this person to be your guide, that this is the, the fundamental rule is, is uh, or the point of view, is to see yourself in another yourself who is better able to manifest that which you already are. And this is fundamental Sufism as well that this, the, the Sufi teacher always knows that what they're doing is they're helping the student or the murid or the dervish to discover that which already exists within them. It's just veiled. You know, that's true of everybody in this room. Every single person here is a deeply powerful spiritual being. You just get it. You know, we have all these veils that uh, keep us from seeing them seeing ourselves as we truly are. Uh, imagining that it is so is a beginning. 
to allow yourself to have the courage to unveil it is the uh, path to follow. Um, there are three factors that are necessary following a spiritual path. You cannot get it right without these three factors. One is courage, I already mentioned. One is discipline, actually doing it, <laughs> right? Doing the practices, or whatever it is that, that, that is recommended to you. And the third one is patience. Letting it happen in its own time. Do not think you could push this process because you cannot. You can encourage it. Uh, but one of the, you know, <laughs> I once said to Pierre Valiat that, you know, I've been kind of telling my students to, if they don't really get it, to pretend they got it. And he got very angry at me. He really kind of, that's the one time he really raked me over the coals for don't you ever tell anybody that. It's not about pretense, it's about actual experience. So you have to be careful <laughs> to, you know, because our, imagina our imaginations are so capable of creating all kinds of stuff, right? Uh, <clears throat> but uh, the truth, the, 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 uh, the evidence of your spiritual expression is how you treat other people, how you feel about them. When you're confronted with someone extraordinarily annoying, how's that feel? You know, it's very easy to be friends with someone that you like, you know, who has similar interests and you know, and you feel comfortable with. But it's a little different when it's someone that you're not all that fond of. Right? It's very, it's very easy to like someone that is uh, beautiful and articulate and intelligent and likes you. <clears throat> it's also extremely easy to dislike someone and to get, let that emotion eventually evolve into hate. It's easy to do that too. The question is what you're going to choose. No. Okay. Another question? Uh, you, uh, you talked about uh, repetition of a phrase or, or some, some discipline like that that mm -hmm. would be useful in spiritual practice. Mm -hmm. Is that called dikr? Is that the Zikr, right? Word? Right. Zikr. Okay. Uh -huh. uh, and I understand that can be um, vocalized or silent. Right. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Is what are Sufis reciting when they're doing this? Everybody's I mean, different. Everybody, every single person gets different practices. It's all, you know, uh, geared to that individual. There are also practices that are common, like uh, uh, the most the most common is la la which is nothing exists except God, which is you know basic statement in the Quran. Uh, it's also the uh, one of, one of those statements that becomes um, it takes a lot of thought. What are you saying? Nothing exists except God, and here I am as an individual person making this statement. How it's kind of like arrogant, isn't it? <laughs> you know. So you work on that. You know, it becomes. And um, uh, but 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 most people have their own practices that are that are assigned to them by their by their guide. And is the purpose to? It sounded like what you were mentioning before that the purpose was to make the blind the mind essentially blank out. That's one of the purposes. Uh, it's twofold, really. One is one is the 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 you know getting getting the mind to be bored exactly, uh, and I'll I'll tell you about my own experience in that regard. And the other is that these practices actually do have an effect on you. Uh, oh, here's the caution: you should never ever do a practice that you assign to yourself. Ever, <laughs> you know. Uh, because you're, you know, it's like you, it's like the, do, you know, the, a doctor should never administer to himself. That whole, it's the same thing, exactly the same thing. Because you're, you're, you're not going to be uh, detached enough to say, okay, this is what you should do. 
That said, uh, the practices have a, an effect in, 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 in a couple of ways. One is the vibration of the, of the syllables, the actual words themselves, the sounds that you're making. The other is the, uh, the, uh, what, what the word uh, represents in terms of uh, the uh, uh, divine attributes, divine intent. And the third, and maybe, maybe the more important uh, um, part of this is how your intent in repeating the phrase or the word, whatever it is. For instance, uh, there's a very common practice of uh, yahai yahak. Uh, hai is life, and hak is truth. So what you, you know if you're going yahai yahak yahai yahak yahai yahak? Imagine what you're saying there. You're thinking, I'm expressing life itself, and I'm definitely expressing the truth. Do you suppose that's going to have an effect on your being? Probably be embarrassing, huh? Yeah. <laughs> you know, should be if that happens. If you start experiencing the truth, okay. What does uh, Sufism say about um, the place of of the woman in in society? Oh gosh, <laughs> that you know that's the first time I've had that question. <laughs> but thank you for asking. Um, traditional uh, Arabic Islamic Sufism doesn't say much. There's a couple of female saints in, uh, in the pantheon. Uh, Rabia al-Alawi is probably the most famous. Uh, and then uh, Hajrat Babajan, who's a saint in, in India. But it's always been well known, because it's cultural, of course. You know, in, in Islamic countries, there's a separation. Not in our order. The order I belong to, it's totally mixed. It's always been well known that in the, these Sufi orders, the traditional Sufi orders going back centuries, the sheikh, the man, was, uh, took care of the men. And his wife, generally his chief wife, if he had you know, more than one, uh, saw to the women. And there was, uh, that's the way it was done. Because they just, culturally, they couldn't come together. They just couldn't. It's just not possible. But they knew that there was equality. OK, does that answer your question? Now, of course, things are changing. Because uh, I read a lot of history. And uh, one of my favorite historians is Will Durant. And his, uh, if you know who he is, wrote the 11 volume History of Civilization, Will and his wife, William Ariel Durant. Um, and his, his basic statement about uh, the female role in history is that they've always been chattel until now. We like to think that somehow primitive cultures weren't subject to that. Uh -uh. <laughs> you know, uh, uh, you know the, the, the big strong man goes off into the woods and kills an antelope and brings it back, dumps it, then he's done. It was a woman, the women that did, did all the rest of the work, right? So that's always been the case until now. This age is changing, and that's why there's such an incredible struggle. Men don't know what to do. Totally confused. We have no clue. And women are not so sure either. I mean, I've had this conversation with many. I'm, you know what? The interesting thing is, uh, of the people that I guide, ninety-five percent of them are women. Very few men are in these in any spiritual organization. I'll bet it's true here. About seventy-five percent of the people here are women, right? Isn't that true? Yeah, that's the way it is in almost all spiritual groups. So what's that tell you? Who's in charge? <clears throat> so I was at the Delta Airport, Delta Terminal in Kennedy. You guys ever been to the Delta Terminal in Kennedy? It is probably the single worst terminal. I'm saying this on, you know, it's a terrible place. Whoever designed it, wow. It's just really just hard to navigate. But anyway, I took Paravalide to the airport. 
Uh, he always flew Delta for some reason. I think he had miles or something. And uh, we went into the wrong section. And, you know, and taking him to the airport was always a trip because his bags were like, you know, books mostly. <laughs> a few clothes. And uh, so we had to walk through this tunnel, this long tunnel, to get to the international section. And we're walking along. And I finally said, you know, Pirvalite, I've been thinking about this whole thing. And it seems to me that in the coming age, there's going to be a much more, a much, you know, equality between the sexes, and there's going to be a much, a, a much deeper balance. And, and he just got this disgusted look on his face. He says, no, it's going to be a matriarchy. <laughs> you know? You have to understand that Pierre Vallat was like a, he was a British officer, right? So he had that whole, and plus he was raised by these, you know, Muslim uncles. So, you know, he had that, but he, you know, <laughs> so for him to admit that, to say that was, you know, pretty profound, I thought. And so I, I've always liked that idea. So, and what that means to me, not that you guys are going to be in charge. So <laughs> What, what it means to me is that what we're doing in this new age, this holistic, or the holistic age that's unfolding, right, as a result of the combination of spiritual and secular, we're creating a horizontal experience of life rather than vertical. Okay? It's been vertical, you know, patriarchy for forever. I'm in charge and do what I say. I'm the boss. I'm the man of the house. All that nonsense. And, uh, What's unfolding now is a much more horizontal way of, that's why men are so confused. They don't know how to do that, all right? You know, we're used to pecking order. You know, why, do you know why people recite sports scores? <laughs> so they can, you know, they could, my, I know more scores than you do, right? <laughs> pecking order, right, in any given group. That's what we do as human beings. We just do it, and women don't necessarily do that. I suppose some women do. I know, I've heard women recite sports scores, uh, but mostly you don't, right? And so it's a matter of getting used to this way of feeling that it's okay for others, other, uh, uh, other individuals to have their opinions. Uh, okay, that's enough said about that. <laughs> Another question? I have another question. Okay. Um, in your book, you talk about uh, solitary retreat you once went on. Uh, yeah. Uh, you go into a little bit of depth on that. Um, my question is, is, uh, is that a common experience in the Sufism path? And yes. Uh, approximately when do they know that you're ready for something like that? Ah, okay. Uh, that's about four questions. Oh, okay. <laughs> Let's see how I can do. Uh, thank you for bringing up the retreat because I wanted to mention something about it, about doing practices. Uh, generally, I, when I have a new uh, Murid uh, student, I will just kind of feel how comfortable they are with the idea. I'll, they'll do a two or three day retreat by yourself. And, and they, almost everyone says, by myself? <laughs> Nobody around? <laughs> uh, and it's, it's a matter of uh, training yourself to do it. So you do, you, traditionally, the way it works is you do two or three days initially, and you do three or four of those, maybe six months apart. And then when it seems like you're ready to do it, you do a couple of six-day retreats by yourself in a room. You're taken care of, I understand. It's, the idea is, is you're, just, you're, you're sitting there in this room, or in a tent sometimes, in a cave if you're lucky, uh, and you're, you've, you've withdrawn from your support system. All the stuff that you have around you that tells you who you are, your books, your friends, your television, your computer, your cell phone, your car, your job, your, and all of that stuff is not there. And that's confusing enough to the mind. It's like, and, and, and so that's the purpose, at least in part. And then you, 
you know, kind of slowly advance through these, through these uh, it, it, traditionally it's three days for a few, then six days for a few, and then a couple of 10-day retreats, then the 15, 21, 30, and 40. 40 is max. You know. That's the normal retreat for someone who's going to be uh, a sheikh or a peer, is to do 40 days. You know. You'll notice that, that that comes up a lot in all kinds of religions, 40 days. Right? Okay. Uh, 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 the reason I wanted to say thank you for that, because I wanted to bring up that this whole thing about doing a practice that's assigned to you in order to develop some quality or have something expand. Well, I was on this retreat that I wrote about in the book. I was sitting there one day and I was doing this practice that I would never do. It was just part of the, you, you often end up doing practices that you would never do as an individual practice, but they're part of the process. And I was doing a practice that would never be assigned to me, it would be never given. And I was doing it and doing it and doing it and doing it, you know. It was, you, you end up saying the same word for an hour or two hours. And I suddenly found myself in the state that this word uh, described. I was there. And I was kind of turned around and I was watching my body, listening to my voice, continue to repeat the word while another part of me was in this, this space. And, and this um, uh, attribute of, of the universe, or divine attribute. And I just kind of hung out there for a little while, and then it was over. But it taught me that it's not necessarily the word itself that, you're, you're, that, that, that will take you into a place of understanding. It may be something totally uh, 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 unusual, you know? So one of the really cool things about this path is you get surprised, you know? Like one of the things we do is we give people spiritual names. Like my spiritual name is Musoir. It means fashion or artist. Activation of uh, attributes, of, uh, not attributes, activation of uh, stuff, right? <laughs> Things uh, like this is an example of Musawir. Somebody made this. Uh, so you know, people that I initiate will ask me to give them a name, and that's always a challenge. Uh, but I always know it's the right name when it's a surprise, especially if I don't know what it means. You know, if some word comes out of the blue, and then I look it up. <laughs> Say, oh, that's exactly perfect for this person. So that, that happens, right? That there's, you get these surprises, these wonderful surprises. And that's when you know you're doing good, when you get surprised. Okay? If you always know what you're doing and where you're going and how it's going to turn out, That's, you're, you're not doing the work. 